Well, I'm sure as more people will come in as we get going here, but we might as well start. It's just after seven. So uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Will Yerman. I'm um, on the faculty and in, in the journalism department at Penn State. Welcome to our uh, Tuesday Journalism Forum. Um, a couple of things, and then I'll turn it over to our guest. Um, as always, I really want to thank the Eberleys for the funding that they've provided for events like this. Um, Joe and Shirley Eberly uh, um, started the endowment um, in honor of Joe's father, Norman, who was a graduate here in the 1920s, went on to a long career in journalism and writing, um, and um, the family wanted to honor him, and we're very appreciative of that. <coughs> Excuse me. We have two more speakers this semester on Zoom. So next week, Brent Lewis, a photo editor at the New York Times, is going to talk. Um, he's had a long career as a photographer and now photo editor, and he's also the co-founder of Diversify Photo, which is a group that uh, brings together a community of non-Western and um, photographers and editors of color. So he'll talk about both of those experiences. And then our last uh, seminar forum speak speech will be on the 13th. It'll actually be a conversation between a documentary filmmaker, Tony Hariza, and a local activist in Philadelphia, um, Rosalind uh, Pichardo. And they're going to talk about sort of both sides of the camera, what it is to create a documentary and what it is to be the subject of a documentary. So I'm hoping that'll be really interesting. And then the last piece of business is this is a webinar. If you've never been in one before, we can't see you. We can't hear you, so you're safe. You can just sit back, relax. Um, but you should have somewhere on your screen the ability to um, ask questions, type in questions, a Q&A button or a chat button. Um, so please drop in questions as we're going and, and we ought to leave some time at the end, I hope, for, for some questions. I certainly have some. So, <laughs> so I'm uh, super excited for our guest tonight. I actually binged one of his podcasts this past week in anticipation. So I listened to the, the Bush v. Gore podcast that you did for Fiasco and I'm old enough to have lived through the 2000 election and I still was sort of on the edge of my seat Somehow I expected things to be different this time, but they weren't. Um, but I learned a lot of things that I hadn't learned before. So um, really excited to hear what he has to say. So um, our guest tonight, uh, Leon uh, Nafak, is a writer, a book author, and a podcaster, obviously. He's worked for uh, Slate, the Boston Globe, the New York Observer. Um, he's founded his own podcast company that perhaps we'll talk about. And he's written a book called The Next Next Level. So I'm going to turn it over to, to you, Leon, and then I'll come back in at the end and we'll take questions from people. Great, thanks so much, Will. I'm, I'm so happy to be to be here. Uh, I really appreciate the, the invitation. Um, I uh, I'm in, I apologize for my scruffy beard. I'm in the middle of the home stretch of production on our upcoming season of Fiasco, which is about uh, the Benghazi attack, uh, and so I'm in lockdown trying to finish it uh, before it's due. Um, but so you know, in preparing for tonight's talk. I, I, I don't know how other people have sort of used their time. Um, as I was sort of thinking about it, I, I, I had to ask myself, you know, who will be in this audience? Uh, you know, what are they going to be interested in? You know, I knew you guys were journalism students, but beyond that, I sort of had to guess, right? Like, how many of you would come tonight because you're interested in podcasting as a medium? How many of you are here because you're specifically into political history? Um, you know, these are important questions if you're trying to decide what you want to say to a group of people. Uh, you want to make sure you come up with something that's going to be interesting and valuable to like as big a cross section of your audience as possible. Uh, and this is a balancing act when you don't know who is in your audience. And so, you know, just as, as an example, like tonight, I want to deliver something that will hopefully surprise you, but not be so you know, mind-blowingly novel or obscure that it leaves you confused and alienated. Uh, I want to say something that will be relevant to your interests, but not so relevant that you already know everything about it and therefore find me boring, right? And on a, on a most basic level, I want the things I say during this talk to make sense to you, right? I want to be legible and clear and comprehensible. Um, but again, like not so comprehensible that it, that it feels basic to you. Um, and so I think every journalist goes through some version of that thought process when they're producing work for public consumption. Uh, and it's a totally worthwhile process because whenever you're trying to communicate, you have to think about what your audience or the person you're talking to is bringing to the table with them. Like, what do they already know? Uh, you know, what are their biases? What are they coming to you for specifically? Uh, 
and you know, when you're publishing something and you're trying to connect with people from different parts of the country, people with all kinds of different areas of expertise, um, people with different life experiences, there's, there's always going to be some distance between you and that audience, like some mismatch between your reference points, your shared knowledge, um, it's just inevitable. Um, and I only really started thinking about this audience question in a deliberate way when I got into podcasting uh, with Slowburn. Um, and I was lucky enough to sort of build a large audience of people whom I had never met and didn't know much about. And I sort of started driving myself a little crazy thinking about, you know, is there an, an average listener um, or a median listener? You know, how, how, do, how do I, how do you make something that is going to be accessible to a wide range of people, all of whom are processing your work through the prism of their own beliefs, their own assumptions? And how do you do it without you know, how do you, how do you reach a lot of people without sacrificing your own particularities or the particularities of the story you're trying to tell? Uh, I know I'm being abstract. And I, I'm sorry. Uh, so let me give you some examples of sort of how these questions inform like the decisions, the editorial decisions my colleagues and I make when we're making podcasts, uh, particularly Fiasco, which is the, the series, uh, I started with my with my colleague Andrew Parsons after we made the first two seasons of Slow Burn. Um, so, for those who don't know, Fiasco and Slow Burn are both, um, I would say, animated by this idea that the past, as we know it in the present, uh, doesn't always resemble or reflect the experience of the people who lived through it in real time. Um, we try to strip away all hindsight and sort of put ourselves back in the moment before. You know, stories like Watergate or the Clinton impeachment or Iran-Contra or the 2000 election uh, had endings, right? So when they were still in the process of unspooling and no one knew where they were going. Um, so if you'll allow me, and let's hope this works, I want to play the opening minutes of season one of Fiasco. Um, and this is a, a six-part series on the, again, the 2000 election and the Florida recount. Um, will, will you tell me if uh, this plays. Um, I will let you know. Yeah, for right. sure. Right. On Thanksgiving morning, 1999, a Florida man from outside Fort Lauderdale named Donato Dalrymple went on an impulse fishing trip with his cousin. The water was choppy as they took their motorboat out into the Atlantic Ocean in search of Mahi Mahi. My cousin, he said, look for seaweed and debris, anything floating on the ocean. And I point out with my finger and I said, like, like that inner tube that's there? He goes, yeah, let's go around that inner tube. Dalrymple was 39 years old and he wasn't much of a fisherman. He owned a house cleaning business, which he still does. Out on the water, he followed his cousin's lead as they scouted for a good place to throw out their lines. Then Dalrymple saw something. We were about 25 yards from the inner tube, never that close to it. And I told my cousin, I said, there looks like there's somebody on there, but they look like they're dead. When Dalrymple got closer, he noticed a tiny hand moving in the inner tube. His cousin jumped into the water to investigate. My cousin's in the water and he's screaming, it's a baby. And he's pushing up and I'm leaning over, almost falling into the water. That's how rough the seas were. And I, I snatched what we know today as Elian Gonzalez. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly summarize what happens next. It turns out that Elian Gonzalez was a Cuban boy brought over to the United States by his mother uh, in a tiny boat that capsized. Um, and his mother died, but Elian survived. Uh, and the question of what to do with him once he was rescued became this huge political controversy in Florida. Um, specifically, Cuban Americans in Florida who tend to vote Republican felt strongly that Elian should be allowed to stay in America, where he had, you know, some relatives. The problem was that Elian had a father back in Cuba, and he wanted Elian back. And so, the American government, then led by Bill Clinton and Al Gore, uh, took the position that Elian had to be sent home. And this led to a months long controversy that ended up having a huge effect on Al Gore's uh, performance in Florida in the 2000 election. Uh, 
we were making, I would say, a few bets with this opening scene. One, we thought people would be caught off guard, uh, like in a fun way, if this podcast about the 2000 election started with a story about a baby being rescued from the ocean by this random fisherman. Um, two, we thought people's brains would sort of send a zap of recognition when they heard the name Elian Gonzalez, um, a name we suspected many listeners would remember, but maybe not very well. Uh, and finally, we thought people would be curious about the connection between these two things, these two seemingly unrelated things that they only vaguely knew about, right? So Elian Gonzalez on the one hand, uh, and the 2000 election on the other. And, you know, inspiring that curiosity at the beginning of our series was extremely important to us. It's always important to us whenever we start a season, um, especially because, you know, when it comes to these big historical events that we take on, most people do already know the ending, right? Uh, as Will joked, you know, it doesn't end differently just because you listen to it on a podcast. Uh, Bush was still going to win, right? At the end of at the end of the series, um, and we could, you know, we could count on our listeners knowing that. We could count on them knowing that Gore lost Florida and that, you know, Bush became president. And so we had to surprise them in some other way. We had to destabilize them off off the bat by starting in an unfamiliar place. Um, and now, you know, whenever we make one of our podcasts now, the, the, the difficult task at the outset is figuring out what will be an unfamiliar place, what will be familiar to the audience and what will be unfamiliar. Um, and as I was sort of alluding to earlier, like the messy reality is that if things go well, if you build a big audience, you know, you're going to have lots of different listeners and some of them are going to be older and they're going to remember the 2000 election quite well. Others are going to be younger and they'll be hearing about it for the first time in, in, in any detail, right? Some of your listeners might be like very politically savvy. And so they'll know all about the Cuban American voting bloc in Florida. Um, and others will have never even you know, thought about it. Um, and the question is, how do you make a show that will work across all those categories? How do you make something that all kinds of different people can connect to? Um, before I talk more about how we, we approach this challenge with Fiasco, I do wanna note that like not everyone has to think about their work in this way. Like there's obviously room for experimental or avant-garde work uh, that is meant to appeal only to a narrow audience, right? A set of people who have very specific reference points and very specific taste. Um, what we do with Fiasco is, to, is we strive to be more populist, right? We're trying to be entertaining and easy to enjoy, but also not so broad that the show feels generic or stale. Um, and happily, what I have discovered is that this is totally achievable and usually it does not require compromising your vision at all. Uh, and that's because in my experience, the best thing you can do if you want everyone to connect with your work or as many people as possible to connect with your work, the best thing you can do is trust yourself to be a stand-in for the audience. Uh, embrace your subjectivity, embrace your ignorance, uh, embrace the fact that like the people who are listening to you or reading you, you went into this knowing some stuff and not knowing other stuff. Um, for me, you know, when I'm making Fiasco, I have to be aware of, you know, the things that caught me by surprise uh, about the story I'm telling, you know, during the research process. You know, I try to identify why certain things surprised me or challenged my assumptions. And then I try to take our listeners on that same journey. I try to recreate it for them, make, make the audience feel it, you know, make them you know, make them forget about the knowledge and the assumptions they might have brought with them to the podcast and sort of coax them instead into inhabiting my perspective, right? Uh, I hope this is making sense. Like the reason I think this works is that even though you're always going to be just one person and you're not necessarily going to be representative of the people who are engaging with your work, being transparent uh, and confident about your point of view, about what you do and don't know, it gets you, it's like almost like it gets you this free pass. Like it's suddenly makes it so that instead of trying to please everyone and trying to give yourself, you know, this sort of omniscient voice, you know, um, that can be, that, that can be universal. Like you can make your podcast or your magazine article or whatever it is you're making resonate with anyone just by being your, like just by authentically being yourself. Uh, and so in my case, you know, that authenticity has to, come through in my voice. Like the best compliment I've ever gotten about the podcast is that 
I frequently sound amazed. Like you can hear in how I tell these stories that I can't believe they're true. That I'm like astonished that all this stuff really happened. Um, and I love that. Like that's 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 the feeling I want our listeners to uh, sort of vicariously absorb. Um, even if even if they came into the podcast knowing way more than I did when I started researching it. Um, for example, like at the beginning of the first season of Slow Burn, I talk about a woman named Martha Mitchell. And uh, people who've heard the podcast know that she was the wife of Richard Nixon's attorney general. Uh, and in the 70s, she was extremely famous in the United States. Like she was on talk shows. She spoke at Nixon campaign rallies. Um, you know, she was profiled in magazines and so on. But I had never heard of her. Like, you know, and so the first line of the podcast is, I'm going to tell you a story you've probably never heard. Um, and so just like that Elian Gonzalez intro I played from Fiasco, this was a bet I was making about our audience. And it, and it was one that paid off. You know, the bet was that they would identify with me. Uh, and so, you know, even like my boss at Slate at the time gave me like a hard time about never having heard of Martha Mitchell before, but he still felt the thrill of discovery that I was trying to um, get across. And, I, you know, truthfully, I got way more people saying to me, how did you ever, you know, discover this person? And, and the answer was like, she's in all the Watergate books. You know, I just hadn't read them before. And, you know, I, I trusted my audience, even the people who had maybe read some of those books to, again, sort of connect with my amazement and that journey of discovery. Um, and so this is why to me, the most important part of solving the audience problem is just accepting your own ignorance, accept what you don't know and using it to your advantage, right? With, with Slow Burn and now Fiasco, I've sort of taken this to an extreme. I generally know almost nothing about the topics we take on. I think the show is at its best when I don't pretend otherwise, right? When you can hear, uh, again, in my voice that I'm learning about this stuff for the first time and sort of processing it out loud along with the listener. Um, so ignorance is a good thing. We should all embrace the gaps in our knowledge and have faith that one, there will be other people like us who also don't know anything and wanna know more. And two, that everyone else will come along for the ride. If you can capture, again, that sort of that feeling of learning something amazing for the first time. Uh, I should say too, that being authentic about your ignorance is also useful as a reporting tactic. Uh, you know, this is something I was taught as like a young journalist, like never pretend you know something you don't know, um, especially when you're interviewing someone because the whole point of interviewing someone is to get them to tell you things and explain things and tell you stories. And if you give in to the temptation to like try to sound smart as if you already know everything, then you'll never learn anything new. Um, I've also found that embracing my ignorance when dealing with interview subjects is that it allows me to tell them with like real sincerity that I'm a blank slate, that you know I have an open mind, that I'm not coming into the conversation with a bunch of preconceived notions. <clears throat> you know, that I'm, that I'm gonna, you know, hold on to no matter what they say. Like no one wants to be interviewed by someone who already knows what they think. And so I think with political stories in particular, there is sometimes an added layer of distrust where, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times like our efforts to get all sides of a story have been met with skepticism by, by people who assume, you know, that we are producing, you know, ideological propaganda for, uh, whichever side they're not on. Um, and in my experience, it, it helps a great deal to be able to say, you know, again, truthfully, that I really don't know what I think yet. And that even if I have certain intuitions, I don't know enough to be confident that my intuitions are right. Um, there's a related, I would say, gross thing that journalists sometimes have to do, which is essentially manipulate people into being honest with them, even when it's against their interests to do so. And I think, if, you know, if, People here have read *The Journalist and the Murder* by Janet Malcolm. You know, you know this is a well-known sort of ethical dilemma for journalists. Um, at what point does the pursuit of an interview subject cross over from sort of strategic and persistent into conniving and 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 uh, you know sociopathic? Um, and this is something I worry about. It was something I worried about a lot when I was working on persuading Linda Tripp to sit for an interview for *Slow Burn* season two. Um, and in the end, I think I succeeded because I was able to be myself with her. I was able to tell her the whole truth about myself, you know, what I believed, what I was confused about, what I didn't understand about what she did, what I found, you know, intuitively repellent about what she did. You know, I could, but I could tell her truthfully that I didn't 
know really what I thought about, you know, every aspect of her story. I could tell her that I was waiting for my research and my reporting to coalesce into some conclusion. This was true, right? I could tell her that, that, that what she said to me was going to shape my thinking. And I think that's why she ultimately said yes. Um, and that strategy or approach, whatever you want to call it, sort of never failed me with, with in terms of trying to, you know, there's certain people who are just never going to talk to you. But I think for everybody else, if you can be your real self, you're going to have better luck. And so, because I think people can detect, you know, sincerity and they can detect a reporter's genuine, like, willingness to have their mind changed. Um, and I think, again, in order to get there, you have to, sorry to keep using this phrase, like embrace your ignorance, embrace not knowing stuff, not being sure you have it all figured out. Um, I think of it as this like one size fits all solution to the two related problems we, you know, as that we've been talking, that I've been talking about that we journalists face. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. One, getting people to talk to us and two, getting people to listen to us. Um, and if you are authentically ignorant, uh, People on both sides of that equation are going to trust you. Your subjects will trust you even if you end up writing something that they don't like or agree with. Uh, and your audience will trust you because even if your work isn't perfectly calibrated to their perspective and their level of expertise, you're doing the work of getting them on your level and making them see the world through your eyes. Uh, and uh, that's, that's sort of how I approach making podcasts uh, that I hope reach a lot of people. Um, and for me, it really works. Uh, and that's sort of all I had. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I think of this as sort of an uh, evolving philosophy. Um, and I, I hope it was a little bit uh, useful to, to hear me think it through out loud. Um, and so I'd love to hear questions if you guys have them. I am, uh, hang on here, rejoining. I don't know if I'm, I'm having Zoom problems today, hang on. There we go. Um, that was great. Sorry, can you hear me, Leon? Is yes, I can. Working? Oh, good. I don't know what's going on with me tonight. Um, that was great. And I have a bunch of questions that, that spring from what you said and things I've been thinking about. And there are already a few questions coming in. But um, I, I'm curious, sort of career-wise, you started as a writer. How and then why did you get into podcasting? And what was the transition? So it happened <laughs> while I was working at Slate. Um, I'd been hired to be uh, a print reporter on the criminal justice beat. Um, and then when the Trump administration started, um, I was moved um, slightly off of criminal justice and onto specifically the Department of Justice and Trump's Department of Justice. Um, <laughs> and so then, you know, it was right around the time when the Mueller investigation was <clears throat> happening. Sorry, I keep moving. Um, I need some water. Excuse me for one second. That seems fair. <laughs> uh, so the Mueller stuff was happening and, and Watergate was sort of being thrown around a lot as a reference point. And we were curious, like, did living through Watergate feel similar to what it felt like living through Trump? Uh, and that was the, that was like the kernel of the podcast, you know, from there it kind of um, I, I had sort of been interested in podcasting for a while. Um, you know, I think when I came to Slate, I, I, I knew that they had a robust, you know, portfolio of podcasts, mostly in the like talk show format. Um, you know, political gap fest, culture gap fest. These were like big sort of institutions, but um, Slate had never done like a narrative documentary style podcast, which, you know, in 2017, you know, after Serial, after S Town, after a number of other shows that really kind of, you know, captured people's attention in a way that, you know, I had always strived to do in my, especially my like long form print stuff. I always sort of dreamed of writing for magazines as my, you know, that that's what I was aiming for out of, you know, coming out of college. Um, but I would notice, you know, when I wrote something really long for Slate, you know, we could see using the back end um, how many people were reading and how long they were reading. And like, it was considered like a great triumph if they, you know, if the average engaged time was like three minutes for a story, you know, that is 5,000 words long or whatever. Um, <clears throat> with podcasting, you don't have this problem. Like I, 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 I just continue to find it amazing that people will, will listen to like five hours worth of pretty dense journalism. Um, 
and that's what I love about it. It's like, it, it feels like cheating. It's like we, as podcasters, like we have access to people to like this whole like layer of people's time um, that, you know, you don't have if you're writing for print. Um, and I think that's, that explains a lot. I think of why it has, why it has um, attracted, you know, all kinds of journalists and the reason it, it has become popular for among listeners. Did you um, get any training, voice training or? or... Only later, uh, you know, I think I did this when I was starting Fiasco. I, I saw a vocal coach um, because like recording was really tough for me. Uh, I'm, as you can probably tell, I talk really fast when I'm just like naturally speaking. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I slur my words sometimes I like mumble sometimes I there's certain like sounds that I have trouble pr pronouncing it's not like a it's not, it's, I wouldn't call it a speech impediment but it's like there's a certain sounds that are tricky for me and so um also I was finding that like my natural cadences were always the same like I kind of had this like go-to move I can't really do it like <laughs> off the cuff but like I had this like go-to move like you know every sentence would go like this and so I wanted to like get you know get some advice on like how to vary up you know vary vary your um tone your your the sort of melody of your of your speech and uh, i also just like learned a bunch of like really useful exercises for you know to do before you record that like kind of loosen up your m m mouth and tongue and stuff interesting i just wondered for people out there who are thinking of podcasting what how, why they should approach that so there are a bunch of questions that sort of fall under the same grouping of finding stories and research. But before we go to their questions, I, I had this question when I was listening to Fiasco, the Bush v. Gore, the first episode, and you sort of addressed it, but um, the, the first episode opens with Elian Gonzalez, who for our, many of our students probably might not have a clue who he was, but he was a young Cuban boy. His mom is trying to escape Cuba. You'll correct me when I get this wrong, but the both of their on sinks, everyone dies except for Elian, who was rescued by this fisherman. And then he becomes this international story and a huge debate over whether to return him to his father in Cuba. And it's that political tension that you reference because it, it potentially hurts Gore, his response. Is that sort of a real quick summary? Yeah. Um, so, so you open with that scene and it's, and it's beautiful because you've got the fishermen and you've got all these voices and it's really descriptive. And then you talk about the homestead, the, um, the town, and then the, is it an air force base the air, the, that they're thinking of converting to a, um, airport, economic development versus environmentalists. And that's another place where Gore seems to sort of not handle it well. And so those, you use those as two examples of things that might have hurt him and cost him votes and ultimately cost him the election, which I, I thought was great. But then he, at the end of the episode, you're like, yeah, but there could be a million other things. We don't really know if he's it at all. And you never come back to it really. Like the rest of the, the, the next four or five episodes are really about what happens after the election. And I and I get that you want to grab our attention and surprise us, but but I'm just thinking like in terms of storytelling, why those two stories and, and why that approach at all. So we really wrestled with this, uh, with that episode. Uh, we wanted to highlight like the contingency of history, you know, in highlighting these two stories that, you know, that on their own, you know, that that seems that seems to on their own determine the election. But like in reality, of course, like something else could have been different, and then it would have gone a different way. You know, um, I, I think it was our way of trying to um, <clears throat> kind of like un 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like <laughs> dismantle people's sense of inevitability in history, like. I think like you look back at historical events and you kind of think like, well, of course it you know went that way. It had to go that way, and uh, it just seems like because it did go that way, that's how it was always going to go. And I think maybe we were trying to like capture like the butterfly effect theory of history, where it's not exactly random, but um, it is really complex, like in the mathematical sense. Like there's this you know geometric uh, interplay between events that you certainly can't understand while they're happening. Um, you know, I'm sure if Gore knew that speaking up for that, you know, for the Everglades was gonna 
cost, you know, is going to be the difference between winning the presidency and not, he might have, you know, made some different choices. But um, I think it was our way of trying to, yeah, like, remind people that even as we lay out this sort of sequential, you know, story that sort of relies on cause and effect, uh, it's, 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 it's like, it's foolish to like read meaning into sort of how things go at some level. You know, I don't, it's not, it's not like a nihilistic thing. It's just more like it was, and, and those two stories fit together really nicely because, um, because uh, when Elian Gonzalez was flown home to Cuba, he was flown home from the Homestead Air Force Base. I think it's when I learned that, I was because we were trying to figure out like, should we make it about Elion or should we make it about this Air Force Base? And then I found out that Elion, when he was returning to Cuba, so we just had to. Yeah. So I was like, all right, we just got to do both. <laughs> like, I mean, in a sense, the whole story is these series of events that could have gone either way, or if if only if, right? If only the butterfly ballot had been designed differently, or if only Nader hadn't run, or if yeah. only they'd had a few more days, or if only you know, whatever, like all these things could have gone a different way. So in, I suppose in a sense, that's at least one sub theme of the entire um, storyline. I don't know if that's true or not. I just was no, I think that's right. Yeah. That. Yeah. Um, anyway, let me let me circle back to some of the questions that have come in and they they're all a lot of them are about sort of process and that kind of thing. But when you're coming up with a concept, do you do you test it? How do you just like how do you decide um, you no, know, Ryan Contra. How do you decide which topic to do? Do you market test it, or is it just a gut thing? It's really a gut thing. Um, you know, it needs to feel like big enough to sustain. You know, a, a, a series. I think like there's some creep. I think in both podcasting and documentary TV, uh, in terms of like people making like 20 part documentaries about things that don't really need to be told in 20 parts. Uh, you know, there's a lot of like cool political, you know, scandals and stuff that we could do, but most of the time when we like kick the tires on something and then decide not to do it, it's because it feels like it doesn't have, it doesn't have like, it doesn't make an argument for itself, like in terms of how consequential it was uh, or like how, how complicated it was. Like we, we look for stories that have you know, that give you, that, that, that allow us to, um, you know, kind of, conf, you know, I'm sort of saying this earlier, like confuse our listeners a little bit, like make them, uh, you know, force them to reconsider their, their priors. Uh, we want stories that sort of like lend themselves to, you know, ambivalence rather than like, oh, obviously like this person was good and this person was bad. Um, so I think, yeah, between those factors, like, you know, we, we also look at like, are there people alive that we can talk to? Like, is there archival footage that we can use? You know, that's like more mechanical, but it's still really important. Um, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't make a podcast about something that happened before, uh, you know, where there's, where no one's alive anymore. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I, I do think like, we think about marketing in a sense, we do think like, will people want to listen to this? Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's no science to it. It's, it's just like, yeah, gut. That leads right into a follow-up question. This is from Kurt Chandler, one of our professors, but um, do you have metrics that like, do you know who your audience is when you're thinking about it? Uh, not really. Uh, if I did, I, I suppose I wouldn't have any, all these problems uh, that I was <laughs> describing. Uh, no, I mean, you know, I sort of get a sense of it like through just, you know, who's tweeting about it and who's reaching out to me and, you know, when we were doing slow burn, we did a couple of live shows where I met, you know, people and, you know, slow burn was like kind of a unicorn. I think, I mean, for, in my, like, I don't expect to make anything that big again, uh, necessarily. It was just kind of like a lightning in a bottle situation. And the range of people who are listening to that show is like completely dizzying. Like, you know, I, I was always proud that I would occasionally get requests over email from people who wanted me to burn the show on the CDR for them so they could give it to their parents, uh, you know, who were in their, like their nineties. Uh, and then also like, I got a couple of letters from like eight year olds who had never heard of Watergate before and now are like obsessed with it. Um, you know, I think, and I was, I think it was actually noticing that 
it caused me to start thinking about like how, how do I deliberately make something that can appeal to both of those constituencies uh, and all the other ones. Um, so yeah, with Fiasco, like it's a much smaller audience because we're behind a paywall. Um, but uh, you know, I would imagine it's pretty it's pretty diverse. Um, yeah. Are there are there topics that you were like this is a natural, and then you did a little research and we're like that's not going to work. It's not. Which yeah, you know? we thought about we thought about doing the Tea Party, like the rise of the Tea Party, um, for season four, uh, and then it just kind of like because it seems important. Like it seems like it was like the you know if not the first, like, you know, uh, blossoming of a certain kind of like rage, you know, rage-based politics that we obviously saw in Trump, but also like, you know, it was a, it was certainly like a, a, a signal moment in the, in the evolution of our politics uh, in a way that we felt would be like probably really resonant. Um, but then we like, yeah, we looked, looked into it and a lot of the, plot, you know, a lot of the subplots that we would have had to sort of excavate and, um, you know, reconstruct involved like congressional procedure and like random like Congress people from, you know, debating, you know, the rules of the set, you know, just like boring stuff that, you know, can can be worth it sometimes. I mean, I think the Bush v. Gore season certainly has its share full, you know, its share of sort of like procedural uh churn i guess and 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 it was challenging in some cases to make that dramatic and exciting and, and entertaining i just thought i just feel felt like the the tea party story would have had even more of that and I, I, we just decided it wasn't worth it interesting yeah yeah it's hard finding the right balance of complexity drama all of those things that you need um so there's a couple of questions about your process. Um, so I'll try to merge them together, but how do you decide what's appropriate for podcasts? You talked a little bit about obviously needing audio, right? People you can talk to presumably, at least for the style of stories you're doing, but someone else asked sort of the bigger question, just like, how do you put together something this big? How do you figure out each episode? How do you structure it? And what, what's the workflow for that? So it generally starts with like a reading period when you know everyone working on the show kind of like, pick some texts and some documentaries to absorb and take notes on. Um, we usually like generate a, a sort of bespoke like timeline, uh, you know, for most of these stories, you can just Google Iran-Contra timeline and it's right there, but making it yourself, uh, making it ourselves like causes us to become sensitive to like where the turning points in the story might be, where the, you know, where's the middle, <laughs> you know, like it sort of, for, sort of forces you to like take stock of the, of the entire, you know, entire series of events that you may or may not include and pick your spots. Right. And so like that, that, that's a really key part of the process is like making that timeline and trying to kind of scrutinize it for the big moments, the big opportunities for drama, the big, you know, the, the, the consequential moments, the ones that you know, that where you can make some kind of cause and effect uh, deduction, right? Um, and so from there, we try to figure out what, you know, what's an episode, like, you know, where does one begin and one, where does one end and the other next one begin? Uh, where could you imagine there being like satisfying, uh, what are they called, uh, cliffhangers? Um, you know, and the other thing is we try to make sure that each of our episodes even as it's like, you know, sequential and you sort of need to, you sort of need to listen to them all together. But nevertheless, like we try to make sure that each episode stands on its own two feet and feels like a coherent uh, experience. You know, like there's usually a set cast of characters per episode that don't necessarily repeat in other episodes. Uh, you know, and it sort of almost feels like writing a, you know, like a novel in stories uh, where like it's a extended universe where you're, sort of meet, you know meeting different meeting different people who populate that universe and you know seeing that universe from different angles in each episode interesting and then another right. reporting starts yeah right um and how big is your team how many people worked on fiasco work on fiasco well uh right now there's six of us but we're kind of making two seasons at once so two of us are working on season 5 and the other four are working on season four. 
uh, and we, you know, we do editorial sort of support for each other. Like the season five team is in on all the meetings and table reads and stuff for season four and vice versa. Uh, and that way we sort of like make sure that everything we're doing has our collective sensibility. Uh, and so, and yeah, I mean, in the, in the past we've, we've worked with a much smaller team. Like when, when Slowburn started, it was just me and Andrew Parsons working on it uh, under, you know, under an editor, but uh, we were, it was mostly the two of us. And so, you know, that's like really hard, uh, especially if you, you know, only have like five months to do it. Uh, and now we have a little more time. We have a little more manpower. It's, you know, I'm still like, you know, like right, right now is like crunch mode for season four. Uh, but every season we sort of try it, we like succeed at reducing the, like the amount of crunch mode there is, you know, like instead of three months of like weekends and nights of work, you know, nights and weekends of work, you, right. you maybe, you maybe you only do it for one month. That's a, that's a victory. So when you say crunch time, when will, when does it launch or do? Well, we don't know when it's going to launch exactly, but um, you know, our, our deadlines are sort of initially set by the engineers we work with. Um, they have their own schedule, like they're a, they're an independent company. And so we sort of tell them when to expect, you know, us to deliver our episodes uh, and they have to block off like a lot of time to work on them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we can't really, screw around too much with that because it'll totally screw up their workflow if we do. Um, they're, you know, they've been super flexible with the pandemic, like, which has definitely slowed us down. Like we've had to change our deadlines for, for Benghazi a couple of times, but, uh, you know, we're, I can't really tell how far we're, we are from done. I think like probably six weeks, uh, which feels insane because there's so much to do, but, uh, <laughs> I think it's, I think it might be true. Are you still reporting like um, in that six weeks or are we in even the editing writing process or definitely still reporting yeah we 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 generally report all the way up to the end and usually wow. usually we're not done with the season until the last episode comes out like we're working on the episodes as they're coming out usually oh so you are still working on the, the last episodes as yeah. the season starts yeah yeah just because like the yeah i mean the the you know I think a lot of people in podcasting are, are finding that like, I don't know, it's just like a kind of a never ending, you know, cycle. Uh, and it's pretty, it can be pretty grueling. Uh, but again, you know, that's like the, that's the, that's, that's the, the goal is to like grow your team, get more time, like right, right. hopefully arrive at a place where you're like not uh, totally burned out. Huh. So let me jump into some of these other questions while we have, we still have a little time, about 15 minutes. Um, so Katie O'Toole, who actually teaches our podcasting class, um, asks, sort of going back to the idea of not coming in with, you know, conclusions about how things are going to be, but how do you balance that sort of authentic ignorance with with the research that you've done? Both, yeah, I guess, I, I mean, yeah. yeah ho hopefully you're becoming less ignorant as you as you research. Uh, but I think like, I, I think what I was trying to say is like, you got to be, you have to like, be sensitive to your own like the evolution of how you see the story like you have to be in tune with like how it's changing in your mind and you want to like kind of recreate that for the audience like you know with with uh i'm trying to think of a good example like with iran contra for example you know it was a total revelation to, to me to realize that you know one of the main you know one of the main figures in the story, Bud McFarlane, uh, saw the Iran weapons deal. I, I want to get too, too in the weeds here, but he saw the Iran weapons deal as step one to potentially staging, you know, helping stage a coup in Iran against uh, I, the Ayatollah. Uh, and, you know, so there's a moment when he said that to me in, an, in our interview and uh, in, the sh in the show, we try to sort of play that moment, not for not for like any kind of puffed up drama, but like I I I'd really dwelled on it because it felt really revelatory to me. Uh, and so I wanted it to feel that way for the audience as well. And when you, you talked about trying to sound authentic on tape, you know, letting your surprise come through, are you talking in the interview process or when you sit down to to narrate or I was talking mostly about narration, you know, like 
I think when I first started podcasting, like I thought, oh, well, like do without a script. Like I'll just like pretend I'm telling my friend a story at a bar and that's how it'll sound. And I tried that with, uh, you know, the stuff I'd done on Martha Mitchell, it just like sounded bad. Uh, it sounded like I was just talking to myself. Uh, and so that's, you know, the scripting is, is essential. Like we, we have to be deliberate about what we say. Uh, but, um, sorry, what was the question again? Well, it's how do you, then if you're scripting it, how do you let your genuine oh, yeah. surprise come out? Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess it's kind of like acting, right? I mean, yeah. trying to like tap into that moment when you first felt it, you know, and try to, you know, try to write it in a way that, that, that expresses how you really feel about it. You know, I think, uh, it's not just delivery. I think that, you know, delivery is important, but, uh, I think that 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 the work of like taking someone on your journey, I think that happens more in the scripting, you know, in the in the order in which you reveal things, for example, right? It, it, what's the most fun for you about doing these? Uh, what's the most fun? Uh, well, I love when they're finished. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I I love I love that I love that the the timeline process. I love the like figuring out where the episodes start and end that's that's really satisfying to me because it feels like you're cracking a puzzle not just like not just like solving a you know a work problem that you have in front of you but also like coming to understand the events you know it's like it's a it's like step one to sort of like developing a theory of like why things went the way they did and i think that i find that very satisfying but i you know i also love i also love really you know interviewing people who were really up close uh and saw this saw these things unfold like from five inches away you know like especially people who are like aren't famous people who are sort of like bit players in history you know or people who sort of happen to you know waltz across the uh the stage uh at the exact right moment and you know get hired to work on the you know impeachment uh inquiry against nixon right and they kind of like live with that for the rest of their lives they that history becomes part of their personal life. Uh, I love capturing that as well. Well, I think like the the fisherman who rescues Ellie. Yeah, Gisella. exactly. Yeah, he's a perfect example. Yeah, right place, right time, and he's yeah, it's become part of his identity. Um, uh, sorry, I can't read the question. Um, someone asked your podcast that delve into history, like Watergate, always seem to be more about the present than the past. Is that intentional? With the Watergate season specifically. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think Watergate as an example, but I, I this person seems to sort of describe all the podcasts that way, all the seasons. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think that's fair. I think like, you know, and maybe that's part of the answer to the question someone asked earlier is like, how do we choose seasons or how do we choose topics? Like, it does have to speak to uh, like the present in some way. It has to like, you know, I think of the, I think of the, the topics almost as like, you know, they have to, they have to like enrich people's understanding of the present, I think. Uh, not just be like interesting on their own terms. They have to be in conversation. They have to be like in, in conversation with current events in some way. Um, so I think if they're not, then they can, the story can sort of feel a little bit inert, right? It's just like, it's a story. Like, that's what happened. Uh, I think, you know, when, when we hit, when we sort of hit the sweet spot of like real, profound resonance. Uh, I think it can really, you know, change how people experience, you know, history as it's unfolding in, in real time. Uh, it kind of does for me. Like, I think I, I watch the news differently um, for knowing about Iran-Contra and knowing about, uh, you know, school segregation in, in Boston. Uh, you know, I think we can't pretend that like, just a, a good yarn is enough. Uh, it has to, not that it has to like have like really pat, you know, lessons for the present or, or insights that we can, you know, sort of put to use, but there's like something kind of uh, magical where like, it's not that it like tells you how to, uh, how to think about things that are happening around you, but it like gives you more like raw material uh, from which to form your reactions to the world, you know? And for you, do you see, 
you know, I mean, history repeating itself to, for, you know, the cliche, but is it, um, I mean, is part of it the lessons that you're learning from whatever, you know, Watergate or, or, or you know, um, Bush v. Gore? So when you listen to, you know, the news today, is that is that what you mean by that sort of connection? Yeah, I mean, I think like actually the biggest sort of way which has changed my perception of current, like of, of my present moment is that like, it, the work we've done like does show that his, history is contingent and, and and again not like random but like not inherently meaningful uh and i think i think being sort of acutely aware of just how many different directions a moment can go uh you know it causes you to it causes you to be like sensitive to 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 little turn you know little subplots in the present that might not seem consequential but like you you can you you know that such subplots are exactly the kind of thing that drive history in the end you know yeah exactly um a couple of questions from from students um what past what podcasts are you listening to or have you listened to that inspire you um you just enjoy i guess yeah um there's a lot uh i mean s town was one of the first like long form audio documentaries i listened to and it felt like totally uh new and original to me uh formally and like texturally like i'd never really like been shown that world before uh or a world like that, um, that really, you know, I, I always think about s because I want to do a season of Fiasco one day that is just about one person. That's really like a, you know, not a biography, but just like one person's journey. Um, I think, you know, I think a lot of our, for the most part, our, our stories have been like, uh, what's the expression from theater where it's like a, it's an ensemble cast, you know, uh, but it'd be cool to make make something that's like really centered around one person yeah that rich yeah yeah um there's a great podcast called west cork which i'll mention just because it uh recently became available on free podcast players um it was previously on audible it's like a it's kind of an early like true crime podcast and it was like it's like completely mesmerizing hmm. west cork west, west cork yeah I have to write that down. Don't forget. Um, here's some other questions. Uh, how challenging is it to get people to talk to you? Depends. Uh, it gets easier, actually. You know, as we have a track record of of doing a good job and like satisfying even people who you know probably just sort of disagree with our emphasis or our point of view, they still feel respected. They still feel heard. Uh, you know, I think we've demonstrated that we can be fair without being like omniscient or objective in this fake way, you know, like, I think people, people who are on the fence, like I just send them the podcast because I think it speaks for itself and, uh, or I'll like send them an article about it, for example, where they kind of describe it in, in a way that I think, you know, puts its virtues on, on display in the way that will be convincing to that person. Uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's just like a dead end and it's obviously it's frustrating, but uh, I always think of like the process of, of creating one of these as like, just like a, a series of compromises with reality. Like you, uh, you set out to like talk to everybody who's in the room and then like, it turns out you can only talk to like two people who are in the room and for the other people, like you have to talk to a journalist who wrote about the people in the room, you know, and like, it's sort of just like constantly, this is part of part of why we like report all all the way up until the end is like we're always trying to like get someone even closer <laughs> to the story uh and if we get that person at the last minute like we'll tear up our script and put them in which is what happened with but with bud mcfarlane have you heard much from any of the subjects because some of the topics are pretty controversial is you know linda tripp listened to it or any of the she did yeah she she liked it uh she liked it and her family liked it. 
it was just like you know i i think sometimes like you, you, you i used to sort of assume that like if i wrote a profile of someone and they liked it that means it was not good <laughs> uh but in that case i don't know i just I, I didn't feel like we pulled any punches with her uh and i think she's just like i don't know had enough distance on the story maybe to to be able to like and no i think it's not just that she had distance on her. i think she's she trusted me like she trusted that i had like really thought it through you know that i had like made the choices I made in terms of what to include, what not to include, what to emphasize by really thinking about it uh, and not just like trying to kind of put together, you know, an approximation of what I think the story should be using what I got. I really like was guided by what I got, you know? I remember in uh, uh, Bush v. Gore, is it the Secretary of State who <laughs> doesn't like the name fiasco for the yeah. name of the podcast? Or? Yeah, we like kind of, I mean, I don't really regret naming the show Fiasco because I think it's a catchy name and everyone remembers it, but uh, yeah. it definitely dawned on me like way too late that it was going to be a problem for certain, uh, you know, certain interview subjects because right. you c come to someone and you're like, hey, I want to talk to you about this thing that you were like intimately involved with and responsible for. By the way, the show is called Fiasco. Uh, it can be a little, uh, you know, you got to, sometimes it takes some explaining. Um, and the explanation is just that like, it's fiasco from someone's perspective, you know. Right, right, right. Or they, or or it's a fiasco from everyone's perspective, but like for different reasons, you know. Right. It's not a judgment of them. It's the you look at the big picture kind of thing. Yeah. Um, where are we in time? So we got a couple of minutes left. So maybe this is a good or at least uh, one of the final questions. So uh, KD O'Toole asks with. Um, this is an amazing number with almost 2 million podcasts out there. Is there room for more? And what, what words of encouragement do you have for student podcast, student podcasters? Um, and what should they be doing to, to prepare themselves? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of podcasts out there. Uh, it's hard to, it's harder now to build an audience than it was even like a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, like even just today, there were like three like big ticket, like prestige, podcast series announced like that are going to come out in the next couple of months and it's like when are people going to listen to all this stuff I don't know uh I mean look for me it goes back to sort of like what I was saying before I know it sounds like so pat like be yourself but like truly like think about like what you have that no one else has like what act like who do you have access to that no one else has access to like what do you know about that maybe other people don't know about that you that you will have an easier time turning into something than anyone else like I, I i like really believe in like figuring out your advantage uh and acting on it you know like i think and and also trusting your own passion like and, and trusting in your ability to uh make that passion uh infectious do you do you have um i guess just following up like specific skills that that students can learn i mean obviously you know passion and and trusting yourself and all those things but like what what skills should they be coming out of college with if they think they might want to do this kind of storytelling i mean asking good questions is like a real skill that it, like i don't know do they have like interviewing classes in journalism school like is that is that like a specific skill that you learn in a class people i mean within a class that's definitely a, a skill that gets at least talked about and yeah that we yeah. don't have an interviewing class but but, I always yeah. wanted. I was. I always wanted to take an interviewing class because I feel like I, like whatever method I use is totally made up and ad hoc, and <laughs> like improvised. Uh, I think I certain. I have certain like. I don't know. I, I'm. You know. I'm sure I have some interviewing style that I couldn't really describe for you, but uh, I think. I think knowing how to ask good questions in a way that makes people want to answer truthfully and expansively is a, is a real skill. Uh, You know, I think uh, being clear, I, again, like I think with podcasting, especially like you, you have no flexibility to be confusing or, or, or uh, <clears throat> like overwhelming. Like it's, you know, the Iran Contra season of Fiasco is like, it was a real dog to make because it was such a complicated story with so many proper nouns, so many different countries involved, so much stuff that like, we knew that most of our audience wasn't going to have any familiarity with going in. 
and you know i think being being really disciplined about like leaving stuff out in service of clarity is important i think uh you know being able to you know being able to like get to the heart of why something is interesting or important and then just like building everything else around that core in a, in a different way than writing it would be i mean is that something you've had oh, to learn no sorry i thought you were talking specifically about podcasting no no i meant both but now i was just thinking is it, it is it how different is writing for a podcast or or constructing a podcast i think it's harder writing for a podcast than for print or at least for me it is because again there's just like so much you know, with, with, if you're reading a print piece and you forget someone's name, you can just go up and look at it, you know, figure out who the person was. In a documentary, you can flash the person's ID every time you show them. Uh, with podcasts, like you really got to make sure people remember the voice, remember the name. You know, you can't have too many voices, too many characters because people are going to get confused. Um, you know, I think, uh, sorry, I'm so sniffly, by the way, I have a cold coursing mm. through me, as you can probably tell. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you you um you really have like you can really lose people by by sort of overloading them and making them stressed out about like remembering dates and you know whenever we hit a point in a script where we, hit, we have to say something like we'll talk about that later or like put that aside it's like okay not working like got to restructure it like you can't ask that much of people you know and i think you can ask less of people in in, in audio than you can in print hmm. That makes sense. Total sense. But I think all that advice, I mean, does apply to everything, right? Um, yeah. Being clear, but learning to interview, I think, you know, so valuable for all, everything we do as journalists. And that's probably a good place to end. We're just past eight o'clock. Um, and um, yeah, I want to thank everyone for being here, but I really want to thank you. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the work you've done. So this is really fun. Thank you me. so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Great. Uh, thank you. And I hope you feel better. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a good night. And good night, everyone. We'll see you all okay. hopefully Take next care. week. Bye, everybody. Bye, Liam.